What's the most underrated aspect of game design? Well, there are a lot, actually, but if you ask me, one of the biggest is definitely enemy design. I don't care if you manage to concoct the single greatest combat system in all of gaming. If the enemies aren't well designed and actually fun to fight, then it's trash. Get it out of here. I don't want it. So today I'll be showing some appreciation for Sekiro's enemy design. And I don't want this intro to overstay its welcome like some previous ones, so I'll quickly go over the criteria for the ranking, as well as what does and doesn't count as an enemy. And the main criteria I'll be using for this list is, of course, the actual movesets. Like, does the enemy have a decent variety of moves and combos? Are their attacks satisfying to deflect? Do they mix it up with any perilous attacks? Is it fun to use certain strategies against them? Etc. Next is how the enemies are used. Like, for example, are the enemies presented in a memorable way? Are they introduced at the right time in the game? Do they work as a teaching tool for anything? And of course, are the enemies well placed, or are they only amidst terrible unfair ganks? And lastly, just any miscellaneous factors, such as cool visual design, or if they help complement an area that they're found in. And while all these things will be considered, just remember that at the end of the day, the actual one-on-one -on -one moveset reigns supreme. While bad ganks and whatnot will keep some enemies lower than they could have been, if they have a really good moveset, they'll probably still make it pretty high. Also, it is a subjective list at the end of the day, and I know there will be some spots that people strongly disagree with. Now, as far as what I'm counting for the list, to me, an enemy is anything in the game aside from bosses and mini-bosses that actually try to harm the player. Meaning no old ladies from Ashina and no passive treasure carps, as they don't actually do anything in an attempt to kill you. Also, I gotta mention this now, I'm including enemies that are technically reused mini-bosses. I know some people will be against that, but honestly, if I didn't include them, then this list would be missing like half of the best enemies. Now, just one more thing to mention, there will be some grouping enemies together here and there. This list is already somewhat redundant as it is, and I just think it would be pointless at times to literally count every single enemy as their own spot. Like, technically, there are eight different types of Mibu villagers, and they all basically die in one hit anyway, and I don't feel like comparing the differences between Mibu villagers with rakes and Mibu villagers with hoes. So yeah, I think that's everything. Cool. Now we can stop wasting time and begin the ranking. At number 50, I have the geckos, because these things are basically nothing enemies. Like, what even is there to them? They don't really have interesting attacks, they always die in one hit, like, there's really not much to say except, I guess they look kinda cool? Even the game doesn't really treat them as enemies. Usually when you hear the sound effect that an enemy spotted you, it's a tense moment that is then followed up by battle music playing. But when these things see you, the music doesn't even play. And they also shoot poison at you, which isn't great. I guess I'd also include the healing geckos here, since they're the exact same thing except their poison attacks don't do damage. So, yep, I don't imagine this will be a very controversial placement. At number 49, I have the crickets. Originally, I was going to put these guys at the bottom, because they're also pretty much nothing enemies, and the geckos look slightly cooler than them, but while getting gameplay for this video, I discovered something truly groundbreaking. So apparently, when the infested seekers, um, barf on you, it then causes all the crickets in the area to go crazy attacking you, so the crickets actually have their own unique mechanic. Though obviously it is very pointless, since you're probably never gonna die from this anyway, so... Yeah. Number 48, Man-Eating Carps. While most of the fish in this game will just swim away if they see you, there are some that will actually try to attack you. They only have one move, but deflecting it is actually kinda satisfying. Though at the end of the day, they also die in one hit, and fighting them isn't a particularly thrilling experience, so... They are where they are. Number 47, Red Palace Nobles. So once again, these are absolute pushovers. Their only actual attempt at damaging you is just by punching insanely slowly, but I do like them from a story perspective at the very least. The lore behind them is intriguing and also really messed up, and it's kind of satisfying but also sad to see this old lady getting her revenge on them. Number 46, Infested Seekers, Non-Parasite. So basically the only thing these guys do is barf on you, and I think every once in a while they also try pushing you, so there's really not much to be said here. The only reason they make it this high is because it's unique and sorta cool that they're immortal. No matter how many times you kill them, they'll always just come back to life 10 seconds later. So that's something at least. Oh wait, that's right, they can also combo you with the crickets. Scratch that, these guys are amazing! Number 45, Test Subjects. These guys have one of the most annoying grab attacks in the game. The animation when they catch you is just so annoyingly long, and that's pretty much the only thing they do, so fighting them isn't really fun. The only reason why I put the test subject this high is because at least they drop pacifying agents when you kill them, which are pretty useful against certain mini-bosses. Number 44, Blue Palace Nobles. 
So admittedly, these enemies can be way more annoying than any of the ones lower on this list. If they manage to catch you off guard, their enfeebling ability is probably the most annoying thing in the entire game. However, I mentioned earlier that part of my criteria for the ranking is how the enemies are used, and while I do hate these guys on their own, the way they're used is admittedly pretty well done. Since they will effectively one-shot you if you get seen by them, you're basically forced to move through their section using stealth, which I find pretty enjoyable. Plus, in between taking them out, you get to fight some other enemies which, spoiler alert, are a lot higher on this list. So overall I actually enjoy their section, even if it is a bit too punishing. At number 43 I have the Sentries and the Red Hat Sentries. These guys serve a similar purpose to the Blue Palace Nobles, except in a way less annoying manner. If they spot you, they'll bang on their gongs to alert nearby enemies, meaning they also force you to use stealth, just in a way less punishing manner. And I have the normal sentries and the red hat ones at the same spot here, since they do the exact same thing except the red hat ones, well, have a cool hat. Good for them. Number 42, Centipedes. These guys really frustrate me, just because they could have been much better enemies. Sometimes they'll use their claws to swipe at you, which you can deflect, which is kind of fun I guess, but the problem is that 9 times out of 10, instead of hitting you, they just spam this stupid fire attack, which can become deadly if you're not paying attention. But is this fun to deal with? Not really. If they got rid of the fire attack and had some more posture, they could have been pretty decent enemies. Number 41, Placeholders. On their own, these guys don't do much. They just pop out from the ground and, well, try to hold you in place, and their purpose is just to hold you so that in the meantime the Mibu villagers can go ham whacking at you. Honestly, I don't like these guys much, but I think they deserve some credit for probably being the only reason why players have ever died to the Mibu villagers. Speaking of which, at number 40 I have the Mibu villagers. And like I said, on their own these guys are pretty weak, but overall I think they're okay. Thematically, it's cool to see how the village was overrun and caused all the villagers to go mad. And while individually they aren't special, they at least have a bit of variety. Some throw rocks at you, others you can deflect, and some of them even have thrust attacks. So while there isn't much thrill in fighting them, they're fine for representing their area. Number 39, Dogs. In most of the Soulsborne games, dogs would easily make the top three most annoying enemies since they're fast and ruthless but Sekiro probably has the best version of them. Since, first of all, it's Sekiro, meaning you can deflect them, but also you can just one-shot them with the shuriken, which trivializes them. I also like how you find the shuriken right next to the first spot with dogs, which feels like it was purposely done for you to try it out on them. Number 38, Palace Hounds. And Palace Hounds are one spot higher because they're exactly the same as dogs, except they look cooler and they also have lightning reversal attacks. So, yeah. Number 37, Monkeys. Now we're starting to get to the enemies that I enjoy fighting. The monkeys don't have crazy movesets or anything, but fighting them can still be pretty fun. Deflecting their attacks isn't too complex, but it's not bad either. Plus, they're just likable, since they're monkeys. And it's also hilarious how ridiculously many of them they put in this one spot at the end of Sunken Valley. Like, jeez, there's so many of them. And next I have monkeys with katanas, since they're the exact same thing except they actually fight you with weapons, which once again is hilarious. And I love how sometimes they'll just say screwed and chuck their sword at you, because why not? Number 35, Roosters. While there isn't much to the Roosters, they're still pretty memorable for how surprisingly aggressive and deadly they can be. And I've heard multiple stories of these things being people's first death in the game aside from Genichiro. They're a great example of how anything in this game can be lethal if you aren't good at deflecting. Also, you can anti-air death blow them, which is always fun. Number 34, Infested Seekers, Parasite. So these guys are like the regular Infested Seekers, except they actually have some pretty deadly attacks, which are decently fun to deflect. They also have a terrifying grab attack, which I think is pretty cool. In reality, these guys could have been ranked a bit higher since they have more to them than some of the enemies to come, but ultimately, I just kept them here since, at the end of the day, there's no real reason to fight them. They always just come back to life. No gold, no skill points, nothing. Just endless fighting, but I could see them being argued for a higher placement. Number 33, Shield Bandits. The main purpose of these guys is just to be a tutorial for the Axe Prosthetic tool, and I'd say they do a decent job at it. At first, they're impossible to hit unless you can get behind them, but if you bust open their shields with the Axe, you can instantly death blow them. And that's really all there is to them. I could see some people saying they deserve to be higher since they're unique compared to the regular bandits, but seriously, once you break their shield, that's it. They're dead. So, while they're a decent learning tool, there's really nothing else to them. Number 32, Bandits with Bows and Katanas. Just a quick warning here, we're about to cover a lot of ranged enemies, so some things to say about these guys can be applied to the coming enemies. And the most notable thing to say about them is that it's fun to deflect projectile attacks. Just the fact that you can do it is really cool. But the main reason these guys are the lowest of the ranged enemies is because these little shits are just so annoying. 
First of all, they use fire and poison on their arrows, which is obviously a pain, but also just the way they're placed throughout Hirata Estate really gets on my nerves. There's always so many of them grouped together in the same spots, and I just hate it. But the main reason they're not lower is because once you get close to them, they'll actually pull out katanas and try fighting you straight up, which makes them decent enough, I guess, but I still don't like them. Number 31, Ashina Soldiers with Matchlock Rifles. Just the regular old default ranged enemies. There's not much about them that makes them stand out compared to the Bow Bandits, but at least these guys don't have particularly bad placements. Up close, they're absolutely helpless. All they can do is block with their guns and attempt to fight back, but learning to deflect projectiles against them is fun. And I don't have anything against them, except this one spot where they're surrounding an Ashina General mini-boss. That placement is pretty uncool. Number 30, Sunken Valley Clan Riflemen. These guys are pretty similar to the Ashina Riflemen, except they actually put up more of a fight in close combat. And they have thrust attacks, which is cool. However, the main thing I like about these guys is how they're used. Since this is a controversial opinion, I'm just gonna say it straight up right now. I really like the gun fort section. I know some people think it's unnecessarily frustrating, but I think it's a fun concept. Having to sneak around and take out ranged enemies one by one was a very memorable experience. And since they don't have much health and poise, dealing with them individually is never an issue. So yeah, I like them. Number 29, Monkey Riflemen. Yes, that's right, Monkey Riflemen. Just the fact that these monkeys are capable of effectively shooting and reloading guns is amazing. Other than that, they're pretty much the same as the Ashina Riflemen. Except they also have the ability to just bum rush you and start hitting you with their rifles, eventually causing them to blow up, which really surprised me the first time I saw it. It seems to surprise them, too. Number 28, Sunken Valley Clan Cannon Users. The main reason I like these guys is for their surprise factor. In all of the places you find them, they're usually pretty high up, so they often end up seeing you in the middle of a fight before you see them, and then you just get blown up out of nowhere wondering what happened. Also, when you get close to them, if you try straight up deflecting, they have some deceptively slow moves which can take a while to get used to at first, so I think they're pretty memorable. They're used well, and they're also used sparingly, so I don't think they're ever really annoying. Number 27, Psychic Seekers, aka the rocket throwing dudes at Sempo Temple. And I have them one spot higher than the cannon guys because their explosive attacks are way more telegraphed, making them rely less on just being an ah gotcha moment, and more so just adding some obstacles to dodge when you're busy fighting melee dudes. I think they're placed pretty well, and their explosions have a delay after hitting the ground, so you have plenty of time to avoid them before they explode, so I think they're pretty balanced. Number 26, Assassins. These guys are also referred to as rats, but the wiki calls them assassins, so I'm just gonna go with it. And honestly, these guys are pretty polarizing to me. I like their unique designs, and the fact that they're so small makes fighting them kinda funny, but honestly, sometimes these little dudes can be a real pain in the ass. Because of the fact that you can barely see what they're doing, predicting their attacks can be pretty hard. It's honestly really hit or miss. Sometimes I do fine against them, and leave the fight thinking they're pretty fun, and sometimes I literally just can't see what they're doing, and decide they're trash. Also, they have poison and grab attacks, which aren't fun. To be honest, these guys and the next entry on the list were the two hardest ones for me to place, since I just genuinely can't decide if they're well designed or not. Number 25 is the Taro Troop with the Great Shield. This guy is easily the lowest rated out of the Taro Troops. I actually used to remember him quite fondly. If you choose to break through his shield with the axe, he gets all scared and I would usually just let him live since it made me feel bad for him. But when I decided to make this list, I gave a go at fighting him straight up, and I honestly just don't know how I feel about this moveset. There's a lot to it, and I'd like to praise him for all of these unique moves, but something about it just feels really off to me. A lot of his attacks involve charging at you, and sometimes I can deflect it fine, but at other times it feels like you can't deflect it if you're in the wrong spot. Also, I think it's literally impossible to break his posture with a deflect. It seems like you have to actually hit him in order to max out his posture bar, which, I mean, I could be wrong about, but I just don't know. So with this guy, it's either trivialize him with the axe, or have a messy ass straight up fight with him. So yeah, probably the hardest enemy to rank on the list. But this also represents a turning point where I mostly only have good things to say about the enemies from here on. Number 24, Ashina Soldiers. These guys are just like the baseline enemies of the game, and I think they do a decent job at being an introduction to the combat. It's pretty easy to break their guard without deflecting, but they can also hit you really fast if you aren't careful, which incentivizes the use of deflecting. There's really not a whole lot to say about them, but they don't do anything wrong, and they're perfectly fine at initially getting the player into the swing of things. Number 23 is the Bandits with Katanas and Torches. These guys aren't much different from the Ashina Soldiers, but the main reason they're above them is because they're just more memorable. When visiting Hirata Estate, you can see them burning the place, trying to get into buildings, checking the ground for valuable items, and getting drunk, and it feels satisfying to defend the estate by taking them out. 
And while their movesets are pretty standard, a lot of the situations with them are fun and tend to stick with you. Also, can I just say this random placement of them in Senpu Temple is insanely bizarre. Like, maybe there's a lore reason I'm unaware of, but, like, seriously, what the hell are they doing there? Number 22, Okami Warriors with Bows. The reason why the Okami bow users are higher than most of the other ranged fighters is because of how they telegraph their shots. In the midst of jumping around, they always release their shot at the exact same time within their jumps, so you can easily learn how to consistently deflect them every time, and it's honestly pretty fun. And when they use teamwork, they can be really lethal. Plus, being one of the versions of Okami Warriors, they're super agile, and it's just fun to watch their fighting style. Number 21 is the Kamari Okami Warriors. And similar to the Bow Okami Warriors, the ball-kicking ones also telegraph their attacks very nicely. Except this time they also mix in some jumping kick attacks, plus you can anti-air death blow them, which is really satisfying. Also, there are certain benefits that go for every version of the Okami women, but I'll go more in depth on that later when I get to the more fun ones to fight. Number 20, Rock Divers. The main thing going for these guys is just the uniqueness and memorability of them. The fact that they jump scare you by coming out of the walls is just really cool in my opinion. And all the while, they're pretty fun and well-designed enemies, complete with thrust attacks and probably my favorite grab attack in the game, since they fully utilize their ability to phase through walls on you. Overall, they're just very solid and memorable. Number 19 is the Hand-to-Hand -hand Seekers, and they take my spot as the absolute best out of the fodder melee enemies. After this point, pretty much all of the remaining enemies are decently beefy ones meant to be taken seriously in a one-on-one -on -one fight. But these guys are the peak of the lowly foes because of their different style and just generally being cool. The way they hop around and dish out kicks is just a lot more fun than basic sword swipes. Plus, these guys prove that it's possible to deflect attacks with bare hands. To us, this doesn't mean anything, but it's cool to know that in the world of Sekiro, you can train hard enough to make your body on par with actual weapons. Number 18 is the Ashina Soldiers with Hats. These guys may seem somewhat basic, and in reality they are, but I feel they deserve a lot of credit for what they represent in the early game. Like I mentioned with the regular Ashina soldiers, they do reward you for deflecting, but at the end of the day, it's still very easy to beat them by just spamming attack. But then these guys just show up and are like, no. Sometimes you have to deflect, and if you're successful at doing so, they'll go down pretty quick, but if you're too stubborn, you ain't getting past the second enemy type in the game. Number 17 is the bandits with axes. These guys are great because they can really force you to play on their terms. They have decently hefty health and posture combined with deceptively slow attacks, which occasionally still throw me off to this day. Unlike the previous enemy I mentioned, it is very possible to beat them without deflecting, but not every enemy should force you into one strategy anyway. Overall, they do a solid job at being one step higher in difficulty than the lowly bandits. Number 16 goes to the Red Guard Soldiers with Flamethrowers. You could argue that, similar to the bandit shieldmen, these guys are really just gimmick enemies meant to show off the usefulness of a certain prosthetic tool. And while there's no denying that, in the case of these guys, the gimmick is a lot cooler, and it lasts for more than just a second. Plus, slowly building up fire on your umbrella and then unleashing an attack of flames is really satisfying. Number 15, Red Guard Riflemen. Unlike many of the other projectile-based enemies, these guys don't give you deflectable shots, as far as I know, but I still think they deserve decent praise. The rockets they shoot are somewhat easy to avoid since they don't come out quite as quickly as bullets do, and the way they're used in the late game is great. Alongside the flamethrower dudes, they create a pretty cool spectacle as you see their side demolishing Ashina's forces and putting an end to their era. Plus, some of them will pull out dual katanas when you get close, and they actually have pretty good moves, which are reminiscent of the regular Red Guard soldiers, but we'll get to those guys later. Number 14, Spear Monks. These guys are just really solid enemies. They have decent health and posture, so you can't just run through them, and they also have pretty fast and lethal attacks, complete with thrusts and sweeps to keep you on your toes. Ultimately, they're not too memorable, but they deserve credit for always being decently formidable. Though I do love how you can eavesdrop on this one dude while Ashina's being destroyed and he's just like, Bruh, I ain't risking my life, I gotta find a way out of here. Number 13, Seekers with Bow Staffs. These guys are great. I love how agile and tricky they are with their movements. Because of how fluidly they jump around and spin their staffs, their attacks can be a bit deceptive and come a good bit later than you're expecting, which I really appreciate because it helps things feel fresh. I do wish there were more of them though. You only really see a few of them throughout the first half of Senpo Temple, and they're mostly seen in sections best handled with stealth, but I still have to recognize that they're pretty well designed. Number 12, Sunken Valley Clan with Scatter Shots. I know this placement will get me a lot of hate, but screw it, I think these guys are awesome. Like the Okami bow users, they always telegraph the use of their shots. Every time after they finish a roll, they'll always shoot at the same time, meaning you can get very used to their patterns. Up close, they only have two attacks, but combined with their rolls and shots, it feels like just enough to keep things interesting. 
Also using prosthetic tools against these guys works really well, especially the spear. I think the main thing people don't like about these guys is fighting multiple at once, but as long as you stealth kill this guy, you'll never have to deal with more than one at a time, so I think their placements are fine. Number 11, Nightjar. I have the Nightjar and the Black Feathered Nightjar at the same spot, because while the Black Feathered ones look cooler, they're also more annoying to deal with since they apply fire, so I'd say they're even. Honestly, these guys used to be insanely annoying to me, because I just couldn't keep up with all their crazy tactics and trickery, but these days I have a lot of fun fighting them. I think their throwing shuriken is a bit questionable though. Sometimes they perfectly boomerang behind you, so you're supposed to just quickly turn around and deflect. Easy peasy but their movement is really inconsistent most of the time. Sometimes they just never come back. Overall, I much prefer when they use their melee weapons. I love the way they jump around and spin them in your face, which is insanely fun to deflect. This combined with their agility makes them really memorable and fun in my eyes. It is a bit questionable though how many of them they put on the rooftops. I don't imagine most players cleared this whole section on their first playthrough, or hell, any playthrough, but I can forgive that because of how memorable they are. Plus, who could forget? Also, I'd really recommend using the shuriken and spear against them, as it makes them a lot less of a headache to deal with. At number 10, I have the Taro Troops. Similar to the Nightjar, these are enemies that I used to not remember fondly, because they're usually placed amongst some pretty hefty ganks. And while that does keep them from being higher on the list, it's hard to deny that by themselves, they're pretty damn solid. They come with some really beefy health and posture, meaning you have to be dedicated to your fights against them, but as long as you are, they're pretty fun and satisfying. The only reasons they're not higher is because, like I said, they're usually placed near way too many enemies. And I don't find them particularly cool. They're just big chonky boys. Number 9, Ashina Fencers. I'm including both versions of these guys here since their differences aren't too significant. But overall, I think these guys perfectly represent a fair, straight up, honorable swordsman duel. Their attacks aren't too crazy, but they have a good variety of slow and quick ones along with some thrusts to mix it up. And I also think they're placed at a nice spot in the game. Once you really get inside Ashina Castle, you know you aren't dealing with any casuals. These guys know what they're doing, and if you can't get past them, then you're gonna have a tough time with Genichiro. Also, it's cool how they're kinda reminiscent of Ishin's first phase. Number 8, Red Guard Soldiers. These guys are so deceptively challenging. Unlike some enemies and bosses which have slightly delayed attacks every now and then, these dudes have pretty much exclusively delayed attacks. On my first playthrough, it took a good bit of trial and error to finally get their timing down, but once you do, these guys are satisfaction central. Plus, I like that they have one super quick double slash that differs from all the other comparatively slow attacks. Definitely one of the best non-boss movesets in the series. Also, I just think they're cool. Their armor looks badass, and their introduction is awesome, since you can see lowly Ashina soldiers fleeing for their lives from them. Number 7 is the Taro Troop with the Bell. This guy is easily the best out of the Taro troops. His moveset is wholly unique, there's really nothing else like it in the game. The way he swings around this giant bell on a rope creates some really fun and dynamic back and forth. It kinda reminds me of how the Orphan of Kos uses his weapon. Also, he has one of the funniest grab attacks in the game, where he just temporarily traps you inside the bell. And when you do get trapped in it, I think it's the most emotion that we hear out of Wolf in the entire game. The only problem I really have with the fight is the grab attack itself. On its own, I think it's perfectly fine, but when he starts spamming it over and over, it kind of breaks the pace of the fight and just forces you to stay away from him. But whenever he's not doing that, I think this is one of the most memorable non-boss encounters in the game. At number 6, I have the Okami Warriors with Naginata Spears. I'm including the regular and lightning versions of them here. Overall, I think they're really cool and have pretty fun movesets, but I just don't find them quite as fun as the ones who use katanas, which we'll get to soon enough. The thing about this version of them is, I like them quite a bit, and when they're firing on all cylinders, they're absolutely exhilarating, but sometimes they're kind of inconsistent. Too often they'll just get stuck in this dumb loop where they use the same attack over and over and over, but when they're not tripping out, they have some great slams, thrusts, and sweeps, and it's a lot of fun. Plus, once again, being the Okami Warriors, they have certain exclusive benefits to fighting them, but I'm gonna talk about that once I get to my favorite version of them. Number 5, Spear Adept. Well, we finally made it to the top 5, and it's starting off with a pick that might get me the most flack of any on the list. And I'll state the obvious right here and now. Yes, the way they're used at the end of Sempo Temple is absolute bullshit. On my first playthrough, I don't think I ever managed to defeat a single one of them in a straight up fight, so fighting 3 of them at once is not what I would call balanced game design. If you want to get through this section without skipping them, you basically have to use a Gaijin's Sugar to get rid of one of the two standing back to back. 
You could also use Blood Smoke to instantly take out the other one if you want. So while their placements are admittedly terrible and keep them from being any higher, what I said in the intro still stands. Moveset is most important, and these guys have great movesets. Once you learn how to stay on top of them, these guys provide some of the most fun in the game outside of boss fights. I love how insanely fast they can spin around and dash all over the place. All of their attacks are really unlike anything else in the game, and they have some of the most fun ones to deflect. Their constant hops can get tiresome, but similar to the Nightjar, I feel these are enemies where you're intended to use prosthetic tools on them. In this case, the Shuriken especially. Plus, if you can predict their jumps and hit them in the air, it almost feels like trivializing them, which is pretty hilarious. So overall, controversial enemies, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't love them. Number 4, Elder Monkeys. These absolute mad chad lad monkeys are the most unexpectedly challenging foes in the game. Since all the other monkey enemies have basically no health, you expect these ones to be the same, but then it turns out they have health and posture rivaling most of the game's mini-bosses. I love that unexpected twist. And when it comes to the moveset, they're really fun. I feel like this is something I've said a lot, but I just love how agile they are. Plus, most of their attacks are very well telegraphed since they'll often clearly start up a swing before hitting you. And I like how they have their ultimate 5 hit combo, which really forces you to play on their terms. Overall, the Chad Monkeys are a lot of fun. Plus, they have beards, which adds to their Chadliness factor. Number 3, Interior Ministry Ninjas. I'm including the ninjas and the lone shadows here since they're exactly the same except the lone shadows also throw in random gimmick tools, none of which I'm really a fan of anyway. But yeah, it's pretty hard to deny that these guys are some of the best enemies FromSoft has ever designed. They have lots of varying attacks, all of which are satisfying to deflect, and it's really cool how instead of just using sword swipes, they mix in some kick combos as well. Including one that ends with a kick that's treated as a thrust attack, meaning if you use Makiri counter, you can stomp on their leg, which is hilarious. Also, the way these guys are used is super memorable. During the invasion of Ashina, they're always lurking around every corner, sneaking up on Ashina's guards. And often when you get into a fight, they'll pop around the corner and join in the fray to try to come out on top. Plus, they're also just really cool. I love how quick and sneaky they are, they really feel like proper ninjas, and in general their placements are well done. With the exception of this one rooftop section, which basically just forces you to use stealth. Sure, if you do use stealth it's totally fine, but if you mess up you'll have to fight multiple at once, which is simply too overwhelming. But overall, these guys are basically everything you could want in a good enemy. Number 2, Okami Warriors with Katanas. While the interior ministry ninjas might be the coolest enemies in the game, the Okami warriors are easily the most memorable. I'll admit that I have some bias towards these ladies, since Fountainhead Palace might be my favorite area in all of Soulsborne, but admittedly, they are a big part of what makes it so great. Speaking of this area, one huge advantage that the Okami warriors have over all the other enemies is their battle theme. While in Fountainhead Palace, the soundtrack that plays whenever you get into a fight is no joke my favorite piece of music in the game. I genuinely think it's better than any of the boss themes. And luckily, to go along with the music, you get to fight some of the best enemies ever. They'll often mix in some quick sword slashes, but the real meat of fighting them comes down to two things. Firstly, they have a super quick combo with a bunch of hits that feels like a mini version of Genichiro's big combo. And they have the ability to bounce on you with their sword strikes, which they can continue doing until either they break through your guard or they run out of posture. Also in this case, I actually really appreciate how the lightning version switches things up. In the middle of their bounces or their big combo, they can instantly switch to using lightning, which throws you off in a good way. Also, how could you not love their battle cries? And to top it off, you can also anti-air death blow them. These enemies are just perfection. And at number 1, Ashina Generals. I feel like people might see this choice as underwhelming. In comparison to the Elder Monkeys, Ministry Ninjas, and the Okami Chad Lasses, there's not a whole lot about these guys that makes them stand out. But damn dude, their moveset just clicks so well for me. Obviously most of the game's enemies will show you no mercy in battle, but I feel like these guys just take it a step further. The way they fight and continuously stay right on top of you is so aggressive and unrelenting, and man, I just can't get enough of it. I love how a bunch of their attacks have this small pause that follows them where they hold their sword in the air and for a split second you think the combo is over and then psych! It's so subtly tricky and it still gets me every now and then. Plus they come with all the basics of a good enemy. Lots of moves and combos, complete with a thrust and sweep attack, and even one long wind up attack that they unleash the moment you get close to them or they bug out and forget to use it. And while they're not the most memorable design-wise or anything, I still think they look pretty badass. So probably an unexpected choice, but in my opinion, the Ashina Generals are the peak of Sekiro's enemy design. 
Well, that's it. I've ranked all of Sekiro's enemies. Make sure to let me know if you guys enjoyed this, or if ranking enemies was a terribly redundant idea that I should be tortured for even having thought of. But if you guys did like it, then I'd be down to do the same for some other games. Whatever your thoughts, feel free to leave a comment. Like, seriously, please do. It's not like I make much money from YouTube right now. The main thing I get out of it is just the fun of expressing my opinions and hearing your guys' thoughts on them. So have a good one, and remember, it's not too late for a Sekiro DLC. They were obviously planning one, and hearing Ishin talk about how meeting Tomoe was one of the few times he almost died, like, bro, please, I want to fight this lady, she sounds awesome. Or maybe FromSoft is busy cooking Sekiro too, and we just have no idea. Probably not. Anyway, see ya.